Hey, deserving listeners, it's time to continue our journey with Paul and Carini on 90 Day Fiance. Let's watch the show. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. I spent the night alone without Karini because she had a miscarriage and she's in the hospital. And I'm staying at a nearby hotel. I can't be there because she can only have one female family member with her. So only her mother can be with her. Yeah. I love you very much. It seems more. I'm scared. I scared lose you. You understand? I love you too. Bye. Love you. So regardless of what you might think of these individuals, one or both of them, you might not like them very much, depending on your opinion and your take on the matter and what you've read in the news. But we can all agree that this is a, a terrible moment for these two people. To lose a child through miscarriage or through any means is a terrible event in people's lives that for some people, for many people, they carry with them their entire life as a significant loss and sadness. So you just have to feel bad for the two of them, have a lot of compassion for them. If you've been through something like this, you probably know how it feels. And I just feel terrible for the two of them. Ah, é muito importante que o Paul me apoie agora, porque eu vou lembrar do bebê, eu vou chorar. Mas eu quero que onde ele esteja, ele saiba que eu e o Paul a gente ama muito ele. E eu nunca vou esquecer ele. So there's a lot that could be said about what a couple goes through uh, after they lose a child and as they lose a child. There, it's a, there's a wide variety of experiences. For some couples, it brings them closer together. For some couples, it causes them to break up. For some couples, it's a variety of experiences. Every, every couple goes, every family goes through its own specific experience and its own specific journey and path as they deal with the loss of a child. How do you, you know, frame it? What's the meaning of it? Do you persevere? Is it wrong to enjoy your life afterwards? These are things that is almost are almost universally uh, experienced by people. Blame of the self, blame of the body. A lot of people in Karini's position will blame themselves. If I was healthier, if I did this, if I did that, it's all my fault. I'm the one who killed my child. And in the vast, vast majority of, uh, of circumstances, that is not rational or, or fair to, to the parents. Uh, from Paul's perspective, a, a lot of the people in his position will feel like they want to help. Um, you know, they're not the one going through the physicality of the experience and they want to be there. And, and if I didn't know the allegations that both of them are um, saying about each other, I would say that they're going through this in a very healthy way. Paul is, is being there for her. He's doing everything he can. He's expressing a lot of sadness and a lot of care. Karini is crying and talking about her grief. A quick note on grief, there, uh, there's a lot of myths about it, and I've talked about this before, but just some education here about grief, because uh, I, I, I've actually half written a book about grief, and I don't think I'm ever going to finish it, because, I don't know, writing a book is a pain, and I've, I've written a book before, and it's a lot of work for not a lot of benefit, but anyway... Um, the thing that I learned about grief was there's a lot of things I learned about grief, but but two things very briefly. One is that this the five stages of grief are not scientifically supported. Um, you know the denial or shock, shock denial, depression, anger, bargaining, anyway, acceptance. It's somewhere in there, and those are certainly stages or experiences that people can go through after loss, but not everyone goes through. Uh, those, particularly in a stage-like format. And plenty of people never go through the bargaining phase. Plenty of people never go through the anger phase. Plenty of people don't never go through the denial phase. So just know that, that the five stages of grief are 
by no means universal. Some people might go through those, but it's not universal. The universal aspects of grief are hard to pin down because grief is so particular to the circumstance and the person. Throughout our lives, we go through all sorts of losses. You know, what's the chances that everyone goes through all of the various kinds of losses in all the same ways? You know, typically we talk about people dying as a loss, which is a loss, but also losing a job or a breakup or a child moves out of the house or you move to another neighborhood or you lose the ability to uh, run as fast as you used to and, and you can't win races anymore. That's a loss as well. Uh, or th there's a new president in the United States and so you lose whatever it is that you were, felt like you had before. It, there's, there's grief after that. There's, there's feelings after a, a loss. The universal thing that we've found, found through empirical observation is that people go through two different positions, either grieving, which is to feel, to reminisce, to be sad, to have waves of emotion, to cry, to talk about, to have ceremony, to grieve. And the other position is to rebuild, to not think about it so much, to move on, to enjoy your life, to not have the emotions uh, manifest, to not choose to reminisce, to not choose to have ceremony. We vacillate between those two positions. Now, everyone has their own path as to what their body or what their uh, system wants to do. For some people, they'll do a lot of grieving up front, and then they'll have a, a year off from grieving, and then they'll have another month of grieving, and that sort of thing. Other people will be rebuilding right after the loss, and they won't grieve until two years later. And then they have all the emotions and all the art form creativity that they create out of that loss. Some people vacillate hour to hour. They'll, they'll be grieving, then they'll be laughing and rebuilding and not thinking, then they'll be grieving and sad and wanting to talk about it. Then everyone has their own path. And the key is, is to understand for yourself what your body wants to do in that moment. A lot of times society or a system, a, you know, a family system or relationships will tend to route people one way or the other and pushing against your own bodily and emotional needs in the moment. For example, for a lot of people going through a loss uh, like this, it's expected by society that you're going to be very sad up front, that you're going to cry, that you're going to think about it, talk about it, not have a lot of joy maybe not do much other than just veg out and watch TV and have waves of emotions and not talk about anything else. And, you know, I would say, culturally speaking, I don't know about Brazil, but in Seattle, I would say most people would generally think, well, a, a normal, quote unquote, uh, grieving, intense grieving period would last, yeah, let's say a week, maybe two. After that point, uh, it's rebuilding time, back to work, back to your normal life, and maybe occasionally you have some tears about it, but you know, for the most part, you're moving on. So the problem with the cultural understandings of grief, which are rampant in all sorts of societies, is that that doesn't always coincide with the natural way in which a, a, a human or a couple or a small family system wants or feels like they need to grieve. For example, for Karini, it's right now she's going through this, this feeling, which seems like it's genuine. But for another uh, mother that lost a child, she might not want to grieve the day of. She might just want to forget about it. She knows she's going to grieve later, but right in the moment, she doesn't want to grieve. And everyone around her is like, how come you're laughing and having fun? How come you're just moving on? You're, you're being so cold. But to the person, they're just like, uh, this is what my body needs right now. I can't, I can't think about it. I can't take the grief. And it'll be pathologized and it'll be judged and the person will internalize that and judge themselves. Grief is a personal path and everyone is allowed to grieve in the way that their body wants to grieve. Another problem that people will run into is say six months later, you're still grieving half of the time because it was an intense loss for you. People will pathologize that. They'll say, it's been six months. Move on. Why are you dwelling on the past? Why are you holding on and ruminating? And to that person, for whatever reason, naturally, they just want to grieve and they, their body needs to go through that. 
but we'll pathologize it and the person will shame themselves. Why haven't I moved on? What's wrong with me? Now, there is potentially some validity to that and that's where therapy can help. But oftentimes I find that people just grieve the way that they grieve. I've seen people still have intense waves of emotion after a loss that was 15 years ago. Uh, research shows that it can last 50 years. So it just is what it is. And why do we have to pathologize it? It's fine. We live in a society in the United States where we think everyone should be happy and productive and not be negative or morbid. That's another thing you'll hear. Why are you so morbid? You know, stop thinking about that. Move on. Why? I, I challenge anyone to come with a, a rational reason why people should suppress their natural inclinations to be sad. What's wrong with being sad? This is the point of the Pixar cartoon movie, Inside Out. Sadness is good. Sadness is useful. It alerts us to what we need to do. It tells us, oh, I need care right now. I need to take care of myself. I need to tend, I have an upwell, you know, that's the function of, of tears and sadness is to alert to ourselves, something's wrong and I need to tend to it. And then an outward expression of sadness is, hey, something's wrong, I need people to tend to me. In America, we hate that kind of sentiment because it implies that we depend on other people, which is like the antithesis of the American, which is a very unhealthy way of looking at things. In, in my opinion and according to research, it's extremely destructive to have this idea that you're not supposed to depend on other people. When we laugh, when we have joy, it tells us, ooh, I like this. When, you, when you know, you're watching comedy and you're, you're giggling on the inside, you're like, oh, I like watching this. This is fun. When we laugh out loud, we're signaling to other people, I like this. When a two-year-old laughs as you, you know, play peekaboo, it's an outward indication to you as the adult that this baby or this infant, this toddler likes what you're doing and it encourages you to continue. There's a very functional aspect to emotions. Emotion, we didn't just evolve emotional feelings and emotional expression as this ancillary thing that is different from other survival uh, evolutionary uh, mechanisms. That was a weird sentence, but I hope you get what I mean. You know, when we feel hunger, it indicates that we need food. When we get thirsty, it's an emotional, vis visceral feeling. It indicate, you know, tells us that we need to tend to getting water and drinking. When we have sadness, it's an it's a, it's a indication that something's wrong and we need to feel as if people care. We need to cry on someone's shoulder and, that, and then we'll feel better. Uh, and all the other emotions. But somehow when it comes to emotions, we just, ah, emotions, you know, they're, they're pesky things. Uh, you're weak if you have them. You're dwelling on the past. And it is one of the most destructive things that's continuing. It's getting worse in a lot of ways. I feel like when I was young, it was bad, but I feel like it's getting even worse. Now, there are movements to have emotional awareness that um, we can point to. There are many versions of masculinity that are, that are emerging that include emotionality, which is great. But I don't see this moving very fast to the point where I have trainees who are therapists who will apologize for crying. They'll, they'll have an intense session with a client. They'll come to me for supervision and they'll cry. The, my trainee, my supervisee will cry and they'll be like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I'm, so, I'm really sorry. I'm crying right now. And I'm like, have you learned nothing about emotions? Do not apologize for crying. Uh, you need to cry right now and do not shame yourself for crying. If you are shaming yourself for crying, then we are lost as a society. And universally, I, I don't know if I've ever met a, a trainee, a supervisee who wasn't ashamed of their own crying. I'm ashamed of my crying because I, you know, society has gotten into my head. It's been 49 years of brainwashing that that to cry, particularly as a man, is is uh, weakness at the least and disgusting potentially. It's disgusting when a man cries, you know, this kind of thing. So, so uh, what are they going through right now, Paul and Carini? You know, they're going through the grief. Uh, they're being filmed as they're going through it, which from the beginning of this, I question that move. I, I would – now, they're not constantly filming, but I don't know. The last episode where I was watching the news being told to them that the child had died, 
I just wish the cameras would have said, oh, camera's out. Let them deal with this privately. Maybe we'll interview them in a couple weeks and see how they're dealing with this or maybe even the next day. But so it's got to be rough uh, all the way around. And I just feel so bad for them. And people out there, think about all the losses that you've been through. Death, death of a pet, death of a family member, death of an, of an ex-romantic uh, partner, a breakup, divorce. Even if it, your romantic relationship was just six months, but it was significantly painful for you. Loss of a job, loss of a physical ability, like uh, the, your, your vision starts to go or your hearing starts to go or you, you start to have pain in your lower back. All of these are losses, um, other kinds of losses that I hear people talk about. Moving to another area. Um, but the big ones that tend to happen a lot to people and aren't acknowledged uh, by society and by individuals is breakups and loss of pets. Um, so, you know, when you think about all those losses that you've had in your life, whatever they might be, make sure that you listen to your body. What does your body need to do? Does your body need to cry right now? Does your body need to turn off this video that you're watching and you know, rummage through old photographs and remember? Does your, does your body tell you that you need to reach out to someone and, and talk about um, the loss? Does your body need to think about how you might feel ashamed and, or angry or whatever it is that your body wants to feel? Or does your body just not want to be into that right now and you just want to watch this video about uh, a reality TV show and, and you know, grieving will be for later. L you got to listen to yourself and don't listen to society or even the people around you or even the brainwashed voice in your mind. It's a, it's a very destructive thing that we have done in our society and particularly brainwashing to people that grief is supposed to be brief. It's supposed to be relegated to right after the loss and anything beyond that is pathological. It's, it's just a, a terrible, terrible notion that empirical science does not support. Don't cry. Hey. Come here. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Hey. Hey. O Paul e eu tivemos problemas. Oh, sweetie, here, come here. Se a gente diz adeus, eu tenho medo que ele vai e não volte. Come here, come here, come here. Come here. Hey. Come here, come here, come here. Hey. I'll come back. So anyone that says that these people only go on the show because they're trying to be famous, I just have to point to scenes like this and say, like, uh, it doesn't seem like at least that's the only reason why they go on the show, that uh, these people seem to have genuine feelings for each other. Now, you could make an argument that some of the other couples maybe not, but I don't know. Every couple that I have reacted to and that you have asked me to watch – uh, there is at least some of their heart involved, and so it's you know it's it's rough that these two people cl clearly have a lot of attachment feelings for each other, and he is sad that he has to go, but he's run out of money. She's really sad that he's going to leave, particularly since she just lost the baby. She feels very vulnerable and really needs him right now, and she said that she's really worried that he's never going to come back. I wonder if it has to do with her own shame that she feels like uh, that she's broken. You know, as a as a mother, I was talking about that earlier. A lot of women who will go through a, a traumatic miscarriage like that will blame themselves, say there's something wrong with my body, and I'm not worthy of someone loving me because my body is um, defective somehow. A lot of a lot of women will have that. Uh, conclusion and belief, even though no one is telling them that. Sometimes people are telling them that, unfortunately. So I wonder if that's playing into her, you know, deep worry that Paul is going to never come back, that uh, he's going to say, ah, I don't want to deal with that. She's defective. Her body's defective. And it also makes me just wonder about Karini's upbringing as well. I wonder what sort of relational traumas that may be present. Of course, I have no idea that might also be playing into this moment. Um, now, I will say that 
without traumas, it's still completely normal to be in a very vulnerable place after an event like this and to also be very scared of losing your partner if they're going to move away. So there's nothing strange about her reaction or both of their reaction really throughout this. So anyway, let's get back to the show. I miss her. I don't want to go up. Do you understand? I have to make money, baby. After the miscarriage, I was thinking, oh man, the baby's gone now. It's over. I was wrong. Dealing with that treasure together made us bond more. I love you. I love you. So, leaving Karini, it's the last thing that I want to do. So, couples will develop a, what I might call, or what people might call, a childish way of talking to each other, goo goo ga ga, this sort of thing. And I've, I've treated couples that will have these modes that they go into where they will talk in, in very childish ways towards each other. You could speculate as to why. Um, you know, one speculation is that we perhaps all have wired within us this um, instinct when we're loving someone to treat them like they are a child of ours. You know, when you have a, a six-month-old or an 18-month-old it's just compelling to want to talk in a certain sing-song voice and to be very, very evocative with your face. Yeah, oh, how are you? Oh, no. You know, those, those kinds of uh, faces because one, I think, is just hardwired into us because procreation and the raising of one's child, obviously, we evolved to have a lot of instincts there. But also babies will uh, reward us with – you know, coos and laughing and smiling and eye contact when we do that sort of thing. So, you know, it's this mutual thing that we do with, with infants. And it makes sense that when we are bonding with our romantic partners that some of that function would be, you know, co-opted, if you will, and that it wouldn't be that hard to just kind of slip into treating both people like uh, we're all eight, 18, months, uh, you're 18 months old. Even kissing itself is, uh, by some speculation, and you know what I've been saying is that uh, we uh, suckle as ch as infants, right? We will suckle, and there's a you know a, an oral thing involved in that, and it's not just for sustenance; it's also for comfort. You know that's why children will have binkies and pacifiers because there's. It's hardwired into us that when we're suckling, it it soothes us. It's it's very it's a very soothing, uh, you know, physicality, and so uh, there are hypotheses that the reason why adults kiss, or why they in some cultures they don't necessarily kiss, but they they put their faces very close to each other, is because we uh, remember we have this echo of the past, we have this association of suckling and obviously we don't necessarily suckle on on each other but we will uh, in a sense suckle on each other's faces <laughs> i'm wondering if this video is going to be flagged by youtube as being you know rated r or something but anyway i hope you get what i'm saying so right now they are having that kind of voice or at the very least paul is having that kind of voice with her nothing strange about that some of you watching right now probably do this with your uh, partner uh, sometimes it takes a bit of thinking it, that you have because it often will happen without your conscious awareness. And so you just have to think like, oh, yeah, last night when we were, you know, doing that or this or that. Yeah, I guess if someone were watching, they would be kind of mortified with how the, the way we talk to each other as as such children. Anyway, nothing wrong with that. Now, I have talked with couples about uh, how they might have problems with that, because if you. If you rely on that too heavily, then it denies the opportunity for couples to have adult conversations. Um, so there, are, there is a usually a balance that uh, that couples will try to accomplish. But anyway, so there's nothing wrong there. Uh, but having said all that, it is notable that uh, their dynamic, according to Paul, and we hardly ever hear from. Uh, Karini, by the way. I don't know why they don't interview her. Maybe she doesn't want to be interviewed. But but from Paul's perspective, she comes across like she is a bit of a child. 
and he has to be the adult in the relationship. And right now, he, although he's below her, he is talking to her the way one would talk to a child. Again, nothing wrong with that. Lots of couples will do that. But it is notable. It is interesting that, uh, at least according to his narrative, she is developmentally immature. She's not responsible. She sleeps all day. She doesn't think about chores. And she likes a lot of childish things, her, you know, her stickers and her uh, stuffed animals. Now, I will say there's, there's nothing pathological about any of that. Um, as I pointed out in another episode, I, I have toys behind me. You can't really see it, but I have Legos right there and <laughs> all these childish. I have like um, on the above, I have like other uh, X-Wing Legos and uh, other stuffed animals <laughs> from my childhood and from my adulthood. So there's nothing, there's nothing, I'm not going to, if I'm not going to pathologize myself, I'm certainly not going to apologize. I'm not going to pathologize other people, but. I wonder if this is some indication of the ongoing vibe. Because, of course, we don't see them all the time. We only see these little uh, bits and pieces, and you just have to wonder about their overall dynamic. Is it one of father-daughter? And almost all the time when I would see a couple in my office, there is always, almost always a, some uh, drift of that nature where – the relationship will become one up, one down, that over function or under function or thing that I, I talk about so often, where one of the romantic partners is like a parent and one of the romantic partners is like a child. Maybe not all the time, but the more problematic, the more pathological a couple is, the more bipolar those two roles become. We don't have a lot of data for these two, but I don't know, just, just it's what I think of when I watch this. I have to make money, baby. After the miscarriage, I was thinking, oh man, the baby's gone now, it's over. I was wrong. Dealing with that tragedy together made us bond more. I love you. I love you. So, leaving Karini, it's the last thing that I want to do. <laughs> now, I will say that on this show, we don't often see functional behavior. <laughs> but this is extremely functional behavior. It's loving, it's caring. Uh, he is responding very well to her emotional state. Her emotional state makes a lot of sense. I, w I can't imagine a, a better approach that he could have in this moment. So I just want to commend the two of them. She's expressing her emotions as is very healthy. And I would very much expect those emotions to be present. He is being practical at the same time attending to her emotions and being sweet to her. So we we want to point that out when we can see it on the show. As much as I really don't want to leave Karini behind, I'm going to fight, do everything I can. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.